continue our series in the practice of Psalms. And today we're in Psalm 103. And uh, I love this psalm. It has all kinds of things that are very encouraging and very practical for us to apply. Psalm 103, again, you know, many of these were written by David. There's also some that were written by the sons of Korah and different people in the book. But a lot of them were written by David. And we're going to read this together. It's a short psalm, but it's powerful. So it's on the screen behind me. Let's read it together. This is what it says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, that's sin, and who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, and crowds you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. In other words, what we really deserve. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy or steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgression from us. So this passage of Scripture is powerful. And uh, I like that part about the youth being renewed like the eagles. Um, I've been playing pentasport with our young people on Tuesday nights. And it reminds you quickly just how old I'm getting. When we uh, these guys are like in their 20s, and we're playing volley, volleyball and basketball, and, and goodness sakes, uh, we're playing dodgeball. Now, I haven't played dodgeball since I was a kid in school, like maybe 13 years old. And all of a sudden, we're throwing balls at each other and trying to you know get them out, and you're trying to stay in, and you're running around. And so uh, every Tuesday, I, I give my all, and we're, we're doing okay, you know. Actually, dodgeball was one of our better nights. We won some games, and we're having fun. We're building relationships. We're building community, and there's people who don't go to the church that we've invited to join with us, so it's a neat outreach as well. And so it's well worth the time. But I'm pretty much tired and sore every Tuesday night when I'm done. <laughs> and uh, dodgeball, that lasted the longest because I had a softball injury when I was back when I was in my 20s and I was in much better shape and I played softball for several years with different uh, church league teams and rec league and I threw my arm out one one season and I, I, I don't know what how it happened about just throwing in from the outfield trying to hit the cutoff man but I threw it out and so now when I use my arm more than just normal day-to-day -day stuff it'll aggravate that old injury and so it's going on like day four now or day five and it's still a little bit sore. Can you believe that? But the good news is there's another one coming up Tuesday. So we've got to be ready. And hopefully most of the soreness will fade away by then. And uh, we get tired. And, and, you know, our bodies over time, they do get a little stiffer, a little sore. But thankfully I can do, I can do basically everything I could do when I was in my 20s. It just takes longer to recover. That's how I look at it. And uh, God is saying spiritually... He will renew our spiritual strength and your emotional and mental strength. We still have these old bodies, but He will give you strength for the journey. He will empower you for daily living. And so we're going to look at this and break it down. Number one this morning is simply this. The Lord provides forgiveness and healing. This is how this psalm starts off. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And don't forget His benefits, who forgives all your sin and heals all your diseases. How many are thankful for that? Amen? Amen? I mean, that's a pretty awesome promise. Sometimes we forget all the good things that God does for us. We forget His benefits. And we get focusing on the negative. We get focusing on my problems for today. Oh, I got the situation at work, on the job, maybe a, a co-worker, or something's going on in my family, and why is this happening? And we tend to just kind of get tunnel vision, and we obsess on the one or two negative things, and we forget the many positive things that God has done. Have you ever done that? Anybody besides me have fallen into that trap before? You know, and, and instead of having an attitude of gratitude, we get negative, and we start to whine and complain, and maybe we get a little angry with God, and we say, why are you allowing this to happen? And yet, think of all the blessings we have, right? 
We have family. We have friends. We have health and strength. We have food and clothes. We have a roof over our head. I don't think anybody's sleeping on the street tonight. And, uh, you know, we're blessed in so many ways. And even more importantly, we have salvation. We have the abundant life now living for Jesus and eternal life later living in heaven with Him. Man, that's a lot of things. And so we forget to thank Him and be grateful for all the good things that He does and bless Him and worship Him in our prayers and in our praise. Now, Jesus provides spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical healing for those who love him. It's funny, in Christian circles, whenever we talk about healing, it's, it's immediately, oh, okay, sickness. And he does heal. We're going we're gonna to dig into that in a moment. But there's also mental illness and emotional struggles and, you know, spiritual sickness. When you don't have Jesus in your life, you're actually spiritually dead, and he causes you to come alive. When he comes into you, he gives you new life through Christ. Mm -hmm. So he heals us in multiple ways, because we're, we're made up of body, mind, heart, and soul, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So we have minds, we have bodies, we have a spiritual nature. And so he heals us in all of these ways, spiritual healing, emotional healing, mental and, mental and physical healing for those who love him, for those that are in Christ Jesus. we got to remember that. It says, you know, that for those who love me, he gives us these benefits. Um, now, we experience sickness, physical sickness, and every other kind because we live in a fallen world. Anybody ever have that uh, existential question posed to you? Now, why, if there's a God, why do we have sickness? Why do we have violence and hatred and bigotry and disease? And, you know, isn't a loving God, why would he even allow this? And people sometimes like to use it as their scapegoat why they're not going to live for God or why they're not going to come to church because I just, I can't believe in that. Mm -hmm. But we've got to remember that God designed the planet perfectly and He created Adam and Eve and, and there was no sickness. They put them in the Garden of Eden. He provided all of the needs, gave them all the plants and vegetables and fruit and, and let them name all the animals. I mean, they were in utopia, right? But when sin entered the picture... And Satan deceived Eve, and she in turn got Adam to join in the deception. They both fell. They're both at fault. We can't just blame the woman, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful woman. They'll do it every time. You know, no, it's, you're both in this together. And they both fell into sin. And once sin entered the picture, then that's where corruption becomes. And so now we live in a fallen world, and the results of sin is destruction. And that's what... Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. And, and sin brings destruction and decay. But thankfully, God had a plan all along that He would send His Son, Jesus, to be our Savior. That whosoever would believe in Him would what? Not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen? So He's our bridge back to God. And one day we'll have an eternal utopia, heaven, living for the Lord. And so, I remember distinctly, I've shared this story before, but when we were living in the States, pastoring there, and uh, my neighbor came across the street, and he kept his house and his, at least his yard, immaculate. I'd never been in this home, but his yard was always pristine. Uh, I think he might have been retired military. He was a very strong, very dignified, sharp guy. But he came over across the street, and we were neighbors, and he must have known that I was a pastor. So he asked me this question. He said, well, why does God allow these things like this shooting that just happened? There was another... Uh, Another shooting that happened in the U.S. at that time. And there's been, unfortunately, far too many. And you could tell he was asking questions. And so I had a chance to talk to him. I said, you know what? That breaks God's heart when he sees these kind of wicked things. Mm -hmm. But these are results of sin. This, we live in a sinful world. Mm -hmm. And people have rejected God. And so those who receive him and accept him, they have help and strength to get through this life and the promise of eternal life. It's a win-win situation. But we live in this state, and so with this comes sickness. And of course, physical sickness is a part of that. Uh, we are deteriorating as a result of sin. Now, here's the thing about healing. And do we believe in healing? Yes, we do. If you believe in healing, say amen. amen. Because Hebrew says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We serve a God who heals. And I've seen healings happen uh, within uh, my circle of influence. People that I know, my grandmother was healed of cancer when she was a young woman and she lived till she was 89 years of age. True story, verified by doctors. She should have been dead and God miraculously healed her 
and her hair turned platinum white. That was the only result, the only real uh, reminder. And it was a reminder that, man, she had cancer. Mm -hmm. She should have been dead, but God healed her. And it was awesome. And he will still do that at times today. But you say, well, Pastor Scott, why doesn't it happen all the time? You know, if it doesn't happen all the time, then maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with you. You don't have enough faith. Or maybe you've got sin in your life. Now, let's be clear. We should pray in faith. Because that's what Jesus told us to do in Matthew 21, right? If you pray in faith, you'll see mountains move. And again, again, he would say, according to your faith that is done. And we should make sure that there's no sin in our life. James kind of touches on that in chapter 5. Confess your sins to one another and, and, and then pray for one another. You can be healed. Sometimes we're harboring things and God is saying, well, you need to take care of this first and then I will answer those other prayers. So make sure you've got a clean heart. Make sure that you've got faith. But even with all those things lined up, we don't always get healed instantaneously. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Anybody ever struggle with those issues or is it just me? Mm -hmm. I think most of us have. We've wondered about that. And it's okay to wonder about that. So here's the thing. God promises healing and He will heal everybody. But for some, it's now. For others, it might be later. But everybody receives their ultimate healing when we, these, in, these corruptible bodies take on incorruption. When we're made into a brand new glorified person when we see Jesus. When we die from this life, and we get to live forever. Our soul goes to be with the Lord. We have a brand new glorified body. Just like Jesus had when he died on the cross. When he rose again. They could see that it was Jesus. They knew that it was him. But he could just appear. He could, uh, he could transport himself from place to place. He had a brand new spiritual glorified body. And yet he could still eat fish with the disciples on the shores of Galilee. I'm really happy about that. Amen. That he could still eat and enjoy food. And, and But he could... Do whatever he wanted to do. He had a brand new body that was no longer susceptible to corruption. And this is, again, what uh, Romans 8, 21, 22 says. Creation itself, now the earth and you and I were all created by God. It says it will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The redemption of our body. And I remember a very wise man, he's a friend of mine. He has two PhDs. He's a retired professor from the University of British Columbia. His name's Matthew Koshi. And we serve on a, a board together uh, for Center for Global Missions. And a large focus of this ministry for years has been ministering in India. And we have a Bible college there. And there's all kinds of churches being planted. Not in the nice part of India, but up in the northern part called Bihar, where uh, Buddhism began. And uh, it's very dark and it's very impoverished. It's a very awful state to live. However, God is blessing and there's churches that are being uh, raised up and there's lots of people getting saved. And so there's this wonderful revival happening. And of course, it's spreading in other parts of India as well. But everybody wants to go to southern India. If you've ever been to India, places like Kerala, it's beautiful. And there's a lot of wealth there. You go up to Bihar... It was known for years as the Graveyard of Missions. That's what they called Bihar, the Graveyard of Missions. But that's where God prompted Matthew Koshi, my retired UBC friend with two PhDs, with lots of money and lots of uh, 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 prestige, very brilliant. And yet God said, go plant a Bible college in Bihar, mm -hmm. where they desperately need hope. And so he did. And my dad got to be a part of that process years ago. And now there's all kinds of churches. There's been, I, I believe, thousands of churches that have been planted now. It's amazing. It's incredible what's happening around there. And it's spreading. It's spreading. It's been going on for 30 years. And he told uh, somebody who talked to him, and, and he faced this way. Well, why doesn't God heal all the time? And I remember he and I discussed this. And he said, well, people who believe you should always be healed don't have a very good understanding of Romans chapter 8. Because Romans chapter 8, what we just read, is very clear that we are in a corruptible state. Sickness and disease, that's part of decay. And because of sin, this earth is decaying. But one day, we all get to be incorruptible, brand new glorified bodies. Amen? Amen. So here's how I put it. God can heal uh, however He wants. It, it is often can be categorized in three ways. He will either heal you instantaneously, where you pray, you lay hands on the sick, and they're healed. And thankfully... Oftentimes that will happen. But he will, might also heal you progressively. 
In other words, he'll put good doctors in your path. There's nothing wrong with doctors, especially Christian doctors. My cousin is a doctor who lives in Everett. Luke, who wrote, you know, uh, part of uh, wrote Acts and, and the Gospel of Luke, he was a physician. He was a doctor. And he loved Jesus. And he believed in miracles, but he still had a trade. He still had a vocation. And so Luke was a physician. So he might heal you instantaneously. He may heal you progressively by sending you to good doctors with the right medicines. And he sustains you and helps you. And he gives you longevity. And maybe you work through that and get fully recovered because of that. Or if nothing else, the third option, we all are healed ultimately. And that's when we see Jesus face to face. Amen? The bottom line is everybody gets healed. It's just a timetable. It's just a matter of when. So don't get hung up on, on the time. Just continue to pray and believe and ask God to heal you. And He'll do it in His time and His way. But stand firm in the faith. And oftentimes He will heal you in the here and now. Supernaturally and instantaneously. Because He is the same yesterday, today and forever. So let's pray and believe for that. Amen. So the Lord provides forgiveness. doesn't matter what we've done. Where we've been, 1 John 1, 9 says he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he provides healing, body, mind, heart, and soul for those that are in Christ Jesus. Number two, the Lord provides mercy and loving kindness. Think about that. We could use more of that in our world today. Mercy is unmerited favor. That's really a definition of mercy. When you don't deserve it, I'm going to show mercy and grace and love to you anyways in spite of yourself. It's unmerited favor. That's what mercy is. Well, we don't deserve it. He helps us anyways. Helping someone even when they don't deserve it. And you know what? That's you and I, isn't it? None of us deserve salvation. Can anybody earn salvation? We can't. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith and not of works, so that nobody can boast. You can't earn it. Our, our, our people that we care about and, and have a heart for and false religions, we've been going through false religions in our Friday Night Fellowship Young Adult Group. You know, the Mormons can't knock on enough doors, right? Uh, the Buddhists can't do enough good deeds and try to earn, quote, karma. Uh, you can't earn it. We're all sinners and we all deserve to die, basically. That's what Romans says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so he provides mercy and loving kindness. We don't deserve it, but he loves us anyway. But we do need to confess our sins and acknowledge that we need his forgiveness and ask him for that. Then he's faithful and just to forgive us. Mm -hmm. um, Psalm 136, 26. Loving kindness. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures some of the time. His steadfast love endures forever. Aren't you happy that it's forever? Amen. Amen. And this is what the problem is when people say, well, we fall out of love. You know, I'm in love, now I'm out of love. I loved her, and then I don't love her. And, and I understand, you know, sometimes marriages don't always work out. There's irreconcilable differences. But um, whether you're married or single or whatever your state is, everybody needs to understand this principle. Love is not something we feel. Love is something we do. Amen? Amen. Love is an action. Love is a verb. So why well, I don't feel like loving God today. Well, tomorrow I do feel like loving God. I don't feel like loving my husband. Oh, now I do feel like loving him. I must have watched a good TV show or had a good cup of tea. And now I feel warm and fuzzy again. Man, it's not based on feelings. Thankfully, our salvation is not based on feelings. Because sometimes we feel like a Christian and you got joy and you got happiness. The next day you have a rotten day. It's like, man, is God even there? You know, we're not saved by feelings. We're saved by grace through faith. By believing in Him and following Him and trusting Him every day. Amen? Amen? And then He chooses to save us. He honors that faith and He forgives us and comes into our life. And he, he is our Lord and we're saved. You can be confident that you're going to heaven one day. So His love is everlasting. It endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 136, 26 tells us. And it's, it, it goes on and it's immense. It's enormous. The question is... Do we show love to others in the same way that God shows love to us? Do we kind of give up on them? Or do we only love them when they're being nice to us, when they're being kind to us, or when we feel like it? God's love endures forever. Will we continue to love those that are difficult to love? 
We will continue to show grace and kindness and mercy to those even when they don't treat us in the same way. This is love, something that you do. Sometimes you have to show tough love. We get that. You don't have to be an enabler or pretend like a, a certain uh, lifestyle is fine and we'll just be passive. No, you can stand up for truth or righteousness. But we love people no matter what. That's agape love. That's the Greek word for God's love, which is it's um, never-ending and it's unconditional. Unconditional love. I love you no matter what. That's how God has called us to love one another. And you know what? It's the greatest commandment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God, first of all, with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's awesome. So, mercy and loving kindness. God provides that. Praise the Lord. Number three, the Lord provides justice for the oppressed. Justice for the oppressed. Sometimes we see this taking place today in, in, in uh, our daily lives. We can see it through maybe legislation. We can see it through humanitarian aid and effort. And I got to go to Haiti years ago uh, with an organization called Convoy of Hope. And they have this huge feeding ministry. They've got a massive warehouse and they feed the hungry there. And sometimes we have hungry people in our own country. And so we see injustice, but we don't always see justice. Sometimes we see injustice. But this is where we know that as Christians, everybody, every human being one day will stand before the Lord and give an account for their lives. So there will be ultimate justice one day. Amen? Amen. And so sometimes we see it in the here and now, in this life and on this earth. Other times we don't see justice and it breaks your heart. But God is the righteous judge and everybody will have to give an account one day. He provides justice for the oppressed. He will do that. Now we can also be the hands and feet of Jesus to help in these areas through missions, through giving, through things like Samaritan's Purse, these shoebox little gifts where we send little toys and school supplies to kids in other countries that have so very little. And we can be a blessing. We can help provide mercy and justice to somebody who really deserves a break in their life. They deserve a helping hand. Um, sometimes we bring things on ourselves. You think, well, God, what, was that just? What was that? And, and we got to stop and think, well, maybe I brought that on myself. Anybody besides me make a few mistakes in life, mm -hmm. do dumb things? And my boys know this story very well. But uh, when I was a kid growing up in Bellingham, Washington, uh, my parents were away. And uh, I could have shared this story. And if so, you get to hear it again and enjoy it a second time. And if not, it will be a revelation for the first time. But... Uh, <laughs> My friends and I would make up our own fun. And when mom and dad's not looking, you can get away with all kinds of dumb things. Mm -hmm. And mom and dad were somewhere else. And it was my older brother, Greg, and myself. And our friend, I think his name was uh, Lonnie, but I can't even remember. But he was like the biggest and I think the oldest of us out of all. So there were three of us. And we were upstairs in our little family room. And we thought, what would be a neat idea is one of us lie on our back and we'll cock our feet and the other person will sit on her feet and then we'll launch it and we'll kind of be able to see how far we can kick somebody out. Kind of like a, a martial arts movie, right? You're going to project them out and see how far we'll go through the air. Anybody ever tried that? <laughs> I encourage you, don't do it. <laughs> do not do it. But we decided this would be a good idea. So, so the biggest kid of all, he lied down on his back and he was maybe, I don't know, uh, 10 or something. And he lies on his back, and my brother is three and a half years older than me, and I have a younger brother, I didn't know if he was born yet, but it was my older brother and I. And so Greg went first, and he sat on Lonnie's feet, and one, two, three, and he kicked his feet out, and Greg went flying several feet, and he landed, bam, right on his tailbone. Right on the, uh, it doesn't matter if there's carpet or not, you're going to hit the hard ground. And he landed hard, I remember he got up, and he was stiff and sore, and it was obviously a that it was not a good idea at that point and somehow I ignored the the obvious warning I thought well I want to have a turn too so Greg gets up he was injured but he was kind of shook it off so then I was smaller and I was maybe six or seven I got down on his feet one two three and Lonnie launched me out and I went flying several feet and then I went bam and cracked my arm on the ground and it broke my arm now if you've never had the joy of breaking bones uh, you're missing out. It's pretty fun because, first of all, there's immense pain, a lot of pain, 
and, uh, and then you have to scramble and get to a hospital, and then they put a cast on you that you're stuck in for weeks on end, and it gets itchy, and it gets cumbersome, but you get to carry that cast around. And so I was like in kindergarten, and I broke my arm, and I had to wear that cast for a long time, and uh, I learned a lesson. Don't do something that somebody else does just because it looks like it might be fun. I need to make my own decisions, <laughs> right? And be smart. Be wise. And so I couldn't say at a tender age to the Lord, God, you did this to me. No, I did it to myself. Sometimes we create our own problems. Amen? Mm -hmm. We create our own problems. There's consequences for actions. And yet, when God sees somebody that's legitimately oppressed, and we're in need, and it's different when you're not serving the Lord, you don't have His protection and His provision. But as Christians... We do have His protection and His provision. He promises that in Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs. If you believe that, say amen. amen. You either believe it or you don't. And I believe that He supplies all of my needs according to His riches and glory. And I've trusted on that again and again. And He has proven Himself again and again. He's always come through. And my wife and I can tell you stories. And we've been on life's journeys. And we've had challenges and trials and tribulations just like everybody else. But God has always supplied our needs. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing is he's blessed us far above that. I mean, we are so blessed as, as people in this country. And so the Lord provides justice for those that are truly oppressed. And he is our help in time of need. Finally, number four this morning. The Lord provides grace to those who honor Him. All the benefits and promises of God are for those who live for Jesus Christ. Everything we're talking about, His forgiveness, His healing, His mercy, His loving kindness, His uh, protection and provision, these are all for those that are living for Jesus. If you choose to live on your own, then you're on your own. You know, I, I, you know, I can't force somebody to come and... and, and the whole thing about coming to Christ is that we come to Him. And then we get to enter into His blessings. The story of the prodigal son, the son went out on his own. And he reaped all those horrible uh, consequences for his actions. He lost his money. He was destitute. He didn't have a home. He was living with the pigs. He was eating pig food. But he had to choose to come back to the Father to enjoy the blessings of the Father. Amen? And that's our choice. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, come to you all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm knocking on the door, but you have to open the door to me. Right? And all the scriptures, lift me up and I will draw a minute to me. But we have to come to him and accept him and come to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm so sorry for my sin. I confess my sin. And I choose to believe in you and serve you as my Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. When we invite him in to be our Lord, then we can reap the blessings that He has to give. That's what the Word tells us. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. I mean, God gets angry at sin, and sometimes we're, you know, we get disciplined, just like a good father will discipline their son or daughter, and they do it out of love because they want them to learn and grow and hopefully not do it again. But the good thing is, man, he's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And it says, for as, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy and steadfast love toward those who fear him. And when you see that word fear, it's not talking about our modern day vernacular, our modern day terminology of fear. It's talking about to revere, to reverence. For those who reverence the Lord, to those that are living for God and serving them as their Lord, then all these things, I'm going to get rid of your sin. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour out abundance upon you. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed our transgression. His great steadfast love is on those who fear him. So we have to come to Christ. Amen. Amen. And this is part of our gospel message. The, the why. You know, we talked about this in our youth class this morning. So why do we press on? Why do we choose to serve the Lord? Why do we, you know, choose to become a Christian? Is it just a cultural thing? Is it something fun to do on Sunday mornings? Is it just because we like the community? Hey, you know, there's great Christian community. There's lots of perks. But we do it because Jesus came to give us life. And only through Christ can we have the abundant life now and eternal life later. That's what John tells us. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life, have a, and to give it more abundantly. Life to the full. 
And then John 14, 6, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Heavenly Father except through me. So if you want to get saved and go to heaven, there's only one way, and that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And with Jesus, not only does He give us eternal life later, but He gives us the abundant life now. He's got a plan and purpose for us living on planet Earth. He wants to bless you and use you, do great things in and through your life. And it's awesome. And the only way to experience it by living for Jesus, who's the life giver. He has a plan to use you in wonderful ways. So this is the why. And of course, we love Him because He first loved us. The Bible tells us that. And out of His love, He gives abundant life and eternal life. So it is a good reason why we serve Jesus. It's the only way to get to heaven. So he provides grace to those who honor him, provision, protection, blessings, favor, but we need to be serving Jesus as Lord. Can we all stand up?